after all the events of the past week or so, how many of you are afraid of this coming week? This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. I know how many of you feel as we go into this week in the United States and and wonder what's going to happen after Wednesday at 12 noon. There has been so much information and disinformation over the past two years, four years, six years. I can understand why people become apprehensive and deeply concerned. I fully understand the day is coming for Christians in particular. We're not going to be very popular. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and this is not just for some time in the future. This has actually been going on for for a long time. The day and times will come when, you know, they, they'll want to kill you. We've seen that around the world since the time of Jesus Christ. I mean, how many of the 12 apostles retired to, to live a nice life by the Sea of Galilee or the Mediterranean Sea and reminisce about the good old days out there sharing the gospel? Did St. Paul get a chance to enjoy the golden years? No, he was put in prison and lost his head. We in the United States have have had it so good for so long, or have we? I think a lot of our our problems today is the 24-7 news cycle on television. They got to keep something going to keep you coming back. This program, I, I do I do want to give you information you can use. There is a part of this world that hates conservatives, hates Christians, hates free speech. We've seen the tech oligarchs. And do they really love the left that much? No, they love the power and the money. Jesus said, and I mentioned it over the weekend program on Friday, Jesus made it clear, and the Bible makes it clear, the love of money not money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Do you think that Mark Zuckerberg is a great fan of Jesus Christ? Do you think that Jack Dorsey loves the Lord? The people that run Google at the highest level? Jeff Bezos at Amazon? Do you think he's born again and loves the Lord and wants to do right by everybody? I'm not judging. I'm just doing what the Bible says. You know them by their fruits. These multi-billionaires have invested everything into this life. This life. And the power that they crave, the money that they have, they are driven to be even wealthier and more powerful, sitting at the table of power in the world. They are probably the biggest part of the problem the Western world faces today. The tech tyrants, I've been telling you since the beginning of this program when we started the daily program at the end of August, and about two or three years now I've been mentioning this and trying to get you to understand that big tech, big social media is not your friend. After Donald Trump was elected in 2016, and this is my opinion now, okay? I I can't sit here and give you tons of uh, verifying facts, but I think that common sense will prevail on this. The way the election was run in 2016, the power brokers of this world that give lots of money to a certain party, and it's not the Republicans, it's the Democrats. They believe fully that their gal, Hillary Clinton, was going to win. The media, the mainstream media, the CNNs, the NBCs, the CBSs, all of them, 
They were in the tank, newspapers and all. Hillary is going to win. It's inevitable. It's her crowning day coming. She'll be the Queen of America for eight years. I believe they they predicted that, not just with polling, but I think they had some, shall we say, insurance policies out there. We know that Peter Strzok and Miss Page had their, their idea of uh, an insurance policy. I think many in government we're in on the insurance policy. There's no doubt about it. Because in certain levels of government, they love power, prestige, and the accolades themselves. They like having something over your head. James Comey, when you think about it, was no different in many ways than one of his predecessors from way back when. J. Edgar Hoover... The cross-dressing kept a dossier file on everybody in Washington, D.C. He spied on them, and he had the goods on them, and people, I would bet, to the President of the United States, he had the goods. They would never mess with him because he could destroy them, crush them like a bug. So to act like everything going on today is, wow, this just happened. It's been happening. 1980, when Ronald Reagan won, many in the establishment Republican Party were offended. They didn't want him. Just like in 2016, the Billy Crystals and all the now never Trumpers, they're, they're, they're giddy right now that he's, he's leaving this Wednesday at noon. And we hear... All these Democrats, they're, they're going to overplay their hand. They want to crush them like a bug going out the door. They hate them. You interrupted our plans. Plans for more power, more money, more wealth, more control. When you hear things like the Green New Deal that has nothing to do with saving the planet, it's a way to control you slightly more. To limit your travel options. Yeah, your carbon footprint. Yet China sits there belching out carbon uncontrolled, and we're the ones that are supposed to reduce our output to save the world. And as we reduce ours, they just increase theirs. Net gain of zero. When you think about it. When you apply common sense and logic. I would venture to say that if you go back to go back to 1961 January of 1961 60 years ago I was just a little kid but before he left office Dwight Eisenhower had this to say And it was almost like a cryptic warning to some, but it makes sense to me now. It has for quite a while. Before he left office, in one of his final speeches, he said, Beware the military-industrial complex. Beware the military-industrial complex. By having the Soviet Union and the Red Chinese and the threat of nuclear war, The arms merchants and those in the technical craft of warfare could make lots of money creating new weapon systems. And they did. Probably one of the biggest employers in Long Island, New York, when I was a young child, was Grumman, sitting out there not far from, in Beth Page. I lived in Hicksville, not far away. And I can remember being outside and looking up in the sky and seeing all this very strange-looking aircraft. You know, the AWAC planes, they were built there, serviced there. The lunar landing module was built there. All of that part of Long Island back in the 1960s and into the 1970s, 
the economy was based on the military industrial complex and it was in parts of california and even lockheed marietta down in georgia the elites of the world love war they don't they don't like peace that's why they don't like trump trump is trying to get peace in the middle east they're busy trying to you know sow discord He's the first president that didn't get us into a new war. And that's why he's hated. He wanted to be a man of peace. I'm not here to talk about his moral character personally, none of my business. But in terms of his policy and what he was trying to do for this nation is why he's so richly hated. He upset the plans of the power brokers of this country and world. He was upsetting the plans of the World Economic Forum. He was upsetting the economy of China. And that's why I'm like many people. I doubt that it was just a stray bat somewhere in China that popped over the coronavirus to attack the world. It wasn't some little accident somewhere. This is not the first go-round. Look at look up SARS, COV, 2003-2004. This virus today is remarkably like that one, except it has a gain of function. Funny, back in 2005 and 6 and 7, we were doing some research on that virus here. Then it went to Canada. And then that virus went to Wuhan, of all places. Could it? No, it couldn't be. Could it, Bob? Yeah, I believe it is. The church needs to be the church. The church also needs to be empowering her people to understand right from wrong and lies from truth. Look, even in this, even in the Revolutionary War, pastors would get in their pulpits, they would be first concerned about the spiritual welfare of their congregation and then empower them to understand the world around them. And the day of tyranny may have to be ended in the colonies. That's simple. And a lot of men put their their lives and their fortunes on the line. They could have lost everything and been hung. In my lifetime, we had the fear when I was a little kid of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it passed. We had the riots. We had the Vietnam War. We've had the gas shortages. We've seen wars in the Middle East. We've seen a lot of things. In the Bible, it says there's nothing new under the sun. And I want you to take that to heart, please. Really, please take that to heart. There is nothing new under the sun. The same evil is out there, and this program will expose it. The same tyrants who would like to have more control of your life are out there if you let them. I really think that some of these governors wanted to see just how far they can go in locking down the economy, your life, and restrict you. Even Governor, as I call him, uh, St. Andrew Cuomo the Pious of New York, finally figured out that you can't bankrupt your state by shutting everybody down and bankrupting everybody out of business. People are leaving New York State in droves. And I hope when they go to places like Georgia, South Carolina, Texas, or Florida, you leave the voting habits that got you into that mess in New York behind while you're at it. Some solid advice. Right now, last week, this week, the Democrats are dancing with joy. They want it all. They have the whole enchilada. You know, pride cometh before the fall. I know the day is coming, maybe in my lifetime. And and one of my messages on this program is always this. Listen to me carefully and don't ever forget this. Just like the Boy Scouts told me 50 years ago, be prepared. 
the church is woefully unprepared. Something comes along and we're, we're shut down and we don't know what to do. We run to Facebook. Yeah, Facebook Live. The tech tyrants don't like people of faith. Get that through your head. It seems to be a very difficult concept, to say the least. Listen, I need to take an early break. I've got some stuff in the next segment I really want to share that I think is important. If this is your first time listening, this is the program Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. We have a website, truththenumber2ponder.com, truththenumber2ponder.com. Today, I just want you to take stock of the world around you. Don't be tossed by everything that comes through social media or your inbox. If you're a Christian for the first time, would you trust the Lord to take care of you? This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. The closed doors of Bethlehem in a moment. Shalom Aleichem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. No room at the inn. One of the most famous phrases in the Bible and in the English language. No room at the inn. When Yosef and Miriam, Joseph and Mary, came to Bethlehem to bear the child Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, they were told there was no room at the inn. We're so familiar with it that we missed the lesson for our lives. Here they are walking in the center of God's will, about to fulfill the ancient prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures and the door slams in their face. There's no room at the end. Bethlehem was filled with closed doors that night. So they went to a manger and there he was born king of the Jews, Messiah, the light of the world. No room at the end teaches us something precious and profound. See, in your life, there'll be many closed doors. It doesn't matter how close you are to God or how much you walk in the center of his will, you'll still come up against closed doors. But when the door closes in your face, when the door closes on that dream and on that plan, on that hope, and you hear the words, there's no room at the end, know for sure that God is something better. The moment the door closes, God is opening up a window. Trust the Lord, stand in faith, and persevere in hope. Remember the manger, my friend, because without the closed doors of Bethlehem, there'd be no manger scene in Bethlehem. And which is more beautiful, a room at a hotel or the manger scene? See, when the door closes... To you in the Lord, know and have confidence that there's something better and more beautiful waiting to bless you as you don't give up but persevere because there's yet a manger in Bethlehem. Want more? Ask for no room at the inn. Now, the free gift for you. What if you discovered the place where the lost Ark of the Covenant was? Well, a newly revealed ancient discovery just as awesome. The mystery of the temple doors, you'll love it. It's our free gift to you. And sapphires, daily spiritual vitamins guaranteed to revitalize your walk or a free New Testament. How do you get all these free gifts? Easy. Just remember Jesus' Hebrew name, Yeshua, and dial it. That's all you do. Just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. But call now. You'll be blessed. 1-800-YESHUA-1. Now, the Jewish people brought you the blessings of salvation. I invite you to join with me to bring it back to them, to bless those who blessed you and reach the unreached peoples from every nation. Just call now, 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or write me direct, the nice Jewish boy, at Box 1111 in Lodi, New Jersey, 07644. It's the nice Jewish boy. It's Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Well, till next time, this is Jonathan Khan saying Shalom Aleichem. Peace be to you, my friend and Messiah. Tik Vatenu, our hope. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And I want to welcome you back to part two of Truth to Ponder for this Monday in a very very unusual week to come, I'm sure, in many ways. Will the world still be here on Wednesday? Maybe, maybe not. Will we have a new president at noon? Probably. Am I worrying about it? No. If you believe in the work that we're trying to do here, of giving you truth, and we're trying to be honest and and put this in the light of God's word, and not to manipulate you, not to scare you, I try to give you things to think about. Sometimes we we just speculate and we tell you that that you know this is a possibility we don't know. 
But I want you to be thoroughly prepared at all times. If you believe in the work that we're doing here, go by the website if you ever get a chance, truth2ponder.com, truth2ponder.com. It would be a great help to know that you're listening. And on shortwave, what uh, frequency, what station means a lot. It helps me because you know, each each month, I've got these radio bills to pay now, and it's a lot of money for a retired guy to have to dig into the savings to do. If you can help, you can do it by you know, helping at the website. Uh, it would mean a lot to me. You can go to truth to ponder truth the number two ponder.com and you can help from there or if you'd like if you'd rather use a regular check you can do that too you can our, our mailing address we're in georgia we stayed up here for a little longer this year long story and it's 21 berkshire b-e-r-k-s-h-i-r-e 21 berkshire lane number 263 now that number 263 is important our our mail people use that as a it's a little box here in this area that we live. And that is in the city of Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, Georgia, zip code 30537. Once again, that is Truth to Ponder, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. If you make a check out, it's Ancient Word Radio. That's Ancient Word word radio and it'll be used 100 percent to cover the expenses for airtime for the program i know there's a lot on everybody's mind about what will happen here in the united states at 12 noon on wednesday all throughout the internet people are sharing all kind of crazy things right now and and i i say lord how do i discern the truth from fiction. I've learned one thing over the past several years, especially in doing this radio program, starting as your weekend show, and now doing this daily program. Don't believe everything that somebody sends you in an email or gives you a link to on YouTube or Vimeo or anything else. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there, and I don't understand why, especially for those that claim to be looking out for our best interest. I have so many really wonderful and good friends that get caught up, and they they look at these things, and they, they live in fear about all the things that can go wrong. As I said in the first segment of the program, if you go back to the QAnon drops and things, and, and people kept trying to get me to look at it, read it, and subscribe to it, and I looked at it for a while, and I started seeing a pattern, and the pattern was very simple. Everything they said was going to happen was never happening, but people were living and breathing this like there's no tomorrow. And it concerned me, so I just turned it off. Just like fake prophets. If you are getting on the radio making false predictions saying, the Lord told me this or the Lord told me that, and you're wrong, I'm not going to listen to you any longer. For a while, I subscribed more of a a curiosity to one of those types. And and I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I, I had to finally just turn the nonsense off. All these prophecies that Trump would win on November 3rd or, oh, it'll be turned around before Thanksgiving or these dates that came and went, never happened. Now, I will go on the record right now. I have no proof, but my heart tells me just by, well, the Bible says abstain from the appearance of evil, just even the appearance And in many states, there was a tremendous appearance of evil, which makes me have to be, well, for lack of a better word, skeptical. I'm going to have a hard time believing you when you're too busy doing things that don't look on the up and up. Let's be honest. They don't. And then you have secretaries of state, like in Georgia, 
that, okay, you can recount the ballots, but they won't look to see if any of them are phony ballots. So if you keep recounting what are potentially fake ballots, you get fake results. I've said that from the very beginning. Could this election have been stolen and could the coronavirus have been used? Of course it could have. But am I going to live the rest of my life in fear over a stolen election? No. Because as a Christian, I have far greater things to do for the kingdom of God. And worrying about politics every day of my life for hours and hours of of my day is not what God has called you or me or any of us to be doing. I will bring on guests. We will talk about the possibilities, things that could happen. And you want to know why? Just like Jesus was telling his disciples for you to simply be prepared. Look for the signs of my coming. The one thing many of us Americanized Christians have got to get out of our head, and I mean like right now, it's one of these, you know, stop it moments. I want you to listen to me carefully. You can't be running around with every little wind of of info, intel, whatever, and thinking, oh, oh, this is it. That's it. What did Jesus tell his disciples when they say, here's the Christ, there's the Christ. He's over in the hills. He's down in the valley. Don't listen. Don't pay attention. But too many people in the church are making that same terrible mistake of paying attention to all the nonsense out there. And you know, that only serves the enemy's cause. We're so busy looking for the boogeyman under the rock that we are never spending the time bringing people into the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I will give you the information you need, and I'll give you things to ponder, to think about, look at, and look at these things as a sign of his imminent coming, which he has promised he is coming again. In my lifetime, in yours, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Even Jesus doesn't know the day of the hour, so I get really bent out of shape with all these people saying, well, this fits this, and and that prophecy fulfills that. It goes back to like the 1970s. I got caught up in that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Man, I believe that Jesus was going to come back again in 1988. I was wrong. And over the years, I've matured as a Christian and began to get deeper into God's Word, and I stopped I stopped listening to all these people and their stupid predictions because just like QAnon, half these people that get money out of you for being on television as Christian prognosticators, they're always wrong. You're wasting your money and your time and you're so busy looking for looking for the evil day, you're not doing the work you've been given today. How else can I put it? We have Christians that are cowering in fear that, oh, my Lord, FEMA's going to come and get me and they're going to put me into a, a camp. Well, so if they do. Stop fearing it. It may never happen. But while you're busy being afraid, you're shortening your life, you're shortening your days, you're shortening your ability to do anything constructive for the kingdom of God. How else can I say it? I love the listeners to this program. You are a gift from God to me. This old retired guy gets some purpose in sharing with you from my heart from time to time, like today, this entire program is from my heart, and I've got something that I want to share. I I, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but I think that I am. I want This is for the new audience in particular for Truth to Ponder. You never probably heard this before on the weekday program, especially those listening on KVOH. About a year ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, when I first was getting information and asked to go back in, into coming out of retirement to help an emergency management agency, I'm getting all these incredible numbers. No one else had them yet. 
the scary numbers that all these millions could die by by May. That's what we were told. Yet I, I just felt, I was asked, it was funny, I was scheduled to preach at a church. And I got to the church, and the original message I had in my mind, I just tossed it aside. And I looked at the words of, of the scriptures, and I just told the congregation to fear not. And I preached a short message. I want to share that message with you today. Everything I said 11 months ago, it's as true today as it was back then. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of hearing your word, studying your word, may you open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, but most important, our hearts to receive that which you have for us. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm glad to see you here today. Has anybody by chance watched the news at all? Or are we kind of out of it and we just ignore it? A little of both. I'm seeing something in my lifetime that I don't think has been around since the Second World War. This fear in the hearts of people. There are two words that Jesus says over and over and over again to his own disciples who follow him, who should know better than most. What are those two words? Fear not. Fear not. Whether you're out on the water, fear not. Whatever this world brings to us, fear not. This is the lesson of Scripture, to fear not. Now, obviously in our human nature, that's easier said than done. I have watched for several weeks, as all of you have, as this crisis, I guess, that is sweeping the land, has driven people to fear everything. People are fearing the Lord's body and blood. My God, I might get something. If Jesus is truly present, I have a hard time believing that. I was talking to a good friend of mine. He has been an emergency manager for a long, long time. I worked for him for about five years. He called me up last night. And we chatted about what's going on in this world today and how their community up in North Carolina, if anybody knows where Asheville and Buncombe County is, he started telling me all the things that they're doing. He said, basically it's what you and I did back with the N1H1 all over again. He said, how would you like to make some extra money? I said, how's that? Um, I kind of need you up here. Would you want to come up to North Carolina in about a week or two and spend a month up here to run the emergency operations center? I said, yeah, why not? For that kind of money, why not? We are preparing for what we, in our minds, for the maximum of maximums. That's a term that Fred Fugate, the former head of FEMA once said, we prepare for the maximum of maximums. We hope that they never occur. I never thought in my 65 years that I would see the price of two rolls of Charmin being worth more than crack cocaine on the street. (laughs) But we've come to this point of fear. We've lost rationality and many live in fear. Of course, I'm going to take precautions. We should all take precautions every flu season, though many don't, which is why many get the flu to begin with. We are probably seeing a lot of young teenagers wash their hands for the very first time on a regular basis. 
because they don't want to come down with this. My heart shares this message with you today. Listen, trust, and fear not. You know, even the disciples after Jesus' ascension that ministered all over the known world, they gave their life for the cause of Christ, yet they feared not. Martin Luther, in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress, alludes to the fact it's not what somebody can do to your body, it's what the enemy can do to steal your soul that you must remember. Fear not in this transient life. Today we heard a reading from the book of Psalms, one of my favorites, and those that remember the old liturgy of morning prayer or in some churches matins, how often did we sing this Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. You you hear all these words, and normally we stop the music halfway into verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And I think a lot of people think that's the entire summation of the 95th Psalm. But it didn't end there, and we didn't end it there today. The other half of verse 7. Today, if ye hear his voice, harden not your heart. As in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. The psalmist is referring to what we saw in our Old Testament lesson. We have no water. We're thirsty. We want something to drink. The children of Israel leaving Egypt has always been a fascinating study for me. For quite a long time, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, was held in captivity as slaves in the country of Egypt. And they mourned and they cried to be released from this bondage. Get us out of Egypt. We are tired of the slave labor. We are tired of being whipped. We are tired of being oppressed. We are tired of living in fear. And God sends them a Moses. To lead them out of captivity. To lead them out of bondage. And we see the hand of God in miracle after miracle preparing them to be released from the bondage of Egypt. And eventually, after the Passover, Pharaoh relents and off they go, though they were pursued. God parted the water for them to escape. And then drowned the horsemen in the sea. Remember that psalm, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. Yet the children of Israel, after seeing all that God could do, what did they do for the next 40 straight years? They complained, they murmured, they failed to trust. You know why they had to be in the wilderness for 40 years? So every one of the ones that left Egypt would be dead. And only their descendants would arrive. God had to purge the unbelief out of his own people in the desert. You know how many miles it is from where they were in Egypt to the promised land? That's the longest 35-mile journey ever known to mankind being wandered around the desert. 40 years. years. They made it roughly 40 miles. 
It wasn't a long trip. Remember, Mary and Joseph made the trip from Jerusalem in a, in a couple of days with a donkey. They were blinded in the wilderness and didn't know where they were for 40 years. Even after everything that God had done, Moses strikes the rock. There's water. We have no food. There's manna. Boy, the onions back in Egypt sound good. Shut up. There are two words that God said to his people in those 40 years over and over and over again. Those are don't murmur. Don't complain and talk to me under your breath. I am the Lord your God who has delivered you out of the Pharaoh's hand of Egypt after how many years of bondage? They didn't even remember a time in their history that they were free. It had been so long. Yet God performs miracles and they still complained. They still looked unto their own personal needs and their own personal desires and their own personal fears. That's why they wanted to go back to Egypt. You have brought us out into this desert. We have nothing. We have no food. We have no water. We have no, no, we, do, we. Let's go back to Egypt. We had food there. So we had to work a little. Notice how the mind forgets. Not long ago, I did a radio show, and I'm talking about how our minds deceive us, how we think how great things were back in 1973 or 1971. And you think of the music, the people, oh, it was just great. And then if you really search your memory banks, you suddenly remember all the things that went wrong, all the difficulties you faced, friendships that fell apart, we conveniently forget the bad and remember the good. The good old days were not necessarily all that good. They were like any other day, filled with good, bad, indifferent. In these days, weeks, and months ahead, we will see this crisis pass. We're not all going to die. And even if we did, if we trust Jesus as our Savior, peace be unto us. For he is with us. Jesus told his disciples as he left this earth, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of this age, this world, this time this understanding that we live in. For see, God is not confined. This is a discussion I've had with a number of people, my wife included. We have to recognize something about the sovereignty of God. He's not trapped in the, in the dynamics we understand and the dimensions in which we live. Today, yesterday, and tomorrow are all in his hand. For he dwells in all of it. He transcends our time and our space. And we have a hard time in our human mind understanding what that means. One of the things that my, our, our brethren in some churches miss when it comes to communion. And it took me a while to wrap my head around it when I was studying for the diaconate. Even though I had always talked about the real presence in the communion service... It finally dawned on me when I finally understood the word used in Scripture for do this in remembrance of me, anamatesis, which means bringing the things of the past into the present as in real time. That's kind of a hard concept. We say it in our prayer every Sunday here and those not yet here. We're not talking about those that should be here that live in Port St. Lucie or Stewart. 
We're talking about those not even born yet that will be a part of Christ's triumphant church. Those not even here yet. We're praying for those that haven't even been born yet. And in our communion, we are drawn into this momentary dynamic that God lives in, that transcends all time and all space. We commune with all the believers from the beginning until the end of this age. And we don't realize it. That psalm, that psalm, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Forty years ago, I was grieved with this generation, and I said, it is a people that do err in their hearts. They err in their heart. You know, poor Israel, given for our example, they had this bad habit of being blessed so much by God than taking him thoroughly for granted, forgetting all about all the things he has done. And they cease to worship and give him praise and honor and glory that he is due. And God, in his mercy and in his sovereignty, obliges them. Fine. You do it your way. I'm going to go over here for a season. And with that hand of protection gone, they keep getting enslaved. You want to be in bondage to your sin? Let me show you what bondage really feels like. These days and weeks ahead, for many will be a challenge. Many are afraid. I get it. I understand it. And I get to help alleviate fears if I get called and head up to North Carolina for a season to help be a public information officer to get information out and hopefully stop the panic a little bit. They say they want to flatten this curve. I get it. In other words, instead of having it spike and a lot of people having it all at once, they want to flatten that curve where less will be exposed. And I think that all the dramatic measures we're taking We haven't seen these kind of measures since 1918 being taken with a medical problem. It's been a long time. And we'll get through it. Like we do every year. I will not live in fear. That's just me. I believe what God's word says. That's why I'm here. I asked the question yesterday, are we meeting or not? Not that I wanted to not. I just wanted to know if anybody else was going to be here or not. I'm happy to be here. One of my favorite hymns, which is really for the transfiguration, "'Tis good, Lord, to be here. Thy glory fills this place." We are here in his presence and in his glory Because this is the real hospital we need for ourselves and our lives and our spirit to be in this place. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we could gather here in your word, in this place. Lord, I understand the fear that many have in their hearts. It's not easy especially when you're being bombarded day in and day out. I understand. Lord, I pray that the comfort of your Holy Spirit abide in each and every one of us. Let us be practical. Let us be, as you teach us, to be reasoned. But most important, to be trusting. Help us to trust and obey what you call us to faithfully do each and every week. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Justice and mercy embrace. There the Son of God gave his life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus. that it's been almost a year since I I shared that message with a church in Florida. And in that year, everything that is contained in that message is as true today as it was back then. Now, granted, we learned a lot about the coronavirus. At the time that I shared that message, I was already beginning to get the information I would need to go back to work in emergency management, where we had these unbelievable figures that, well, three million people could die by the time we got to the month of June. Yet in spite of knowing 
that that was a a possibility. Those that claim the name of Christ need to stop living in fear. I know it's not easy to do. It's not a part of our, our human nature not to fear. This past year has been one of the most unusual years. 2020 will go down as probably the most unusual year I ever experienced in my entire life. Between the pandemic, the fear, the shutdowns, the lockdowns, the travel restrictions, anything like that that happened, the election, the angst, the anger, the media, we need to just resolve ourselves to a few things. The media in the United States is not to be trusted. Very simple. Just don't trust them. Don't dwell on it. Like so many conspiracy theories that get floated that turned out to be wrong. I have so many people, as I mentioned on the first part of the program, family members, they they get these videos and someone shares something and it sounds so real. Yet I look at all the so-called conspiracy theories that started way back in 2017 and kind of got amplified in 2019 and 2020 no better and how many of those how many of those videos that you know we're going to go into martial law we're going to be having arrest by any moment right now how many of those how many of those came true well none of them when i do this radio program there's several things that i want you to understand As Christians, we always need to be ready. Ready for the things that may come our way, like it or not. The world does not like the faith. And yes, those of us in the faith are not going to be the most popular people in the world. In fact, even Jesus says the day is going to come that they will hate you. They will kill you. That's not something in the future. It's been happening all the long since the beginning of the church. And too many people are so stuck in the book of Revelation looking for something yet to come. And they're totally missing. They are totally missing the things that already have come and we're going through right now. I believe God is moving his people place to place, preparing us to to be ready for a different world. And all through that, Jesus keeps reminding us, fear not. Don't worry about what's required of you in difficult days because Jesus himself will get you through. I don't know what the world is going to be like after Wednesday at 12 noon. I don't know what the world is going to be like in June or next week or next weekend. It's not for me to know. My job is to do the best that I can to help you be prepared and informed and not to be tossed to and fro by by every conspiracy theory or wind of doctrine. It's a it's hard to do sometimes because even I get caught up. And if you believe in this ministry, Truth to Ponder, would you consider helping pay for the airtime on shortwave? You can buy. You can write us here at 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, Visit our website, Truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's Truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.